Today on the No City on the Sideline Dad podcast, my guest, Gregory Silver, is the director of operation of three drug alcohol treatment centers in Southern California. He also, when he started, he was a marketing industry professional, and also what changed his trajectory in life is his best friend passed away from overdose in 2012. Gregory feels his calling to help others in substance abuse and addiction. His passion is to help people in many lives. Welcome to the podcast, Gregory. Hey, Joe. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be able to talk to your audience about this. Well, thank you, Ian. I really do appreciate it. Drug addiction, um, alcoholism, and all that, it's a really something that we don't talk about, especially in the last couple of years with the pandemic. But it seems like it is a growing epidemic, especially with the certain ones. How did you get involved in something like this? Well, um, I was really ignorant when it came to uh, treatment and how to help someone. And uh, like uh, you mentioned in your opening, I, my best friend, he actually house sat for me and I worked for a company that took me, um, to France a lot. So I was working in France and my friend would house sit for me. He was like my best friend. We were really pretty close. And, uh, the guy was hilarious. She'd never know that there was a problem, <laughs> but he started drinking a little too much. And then I found out he was taking Xanax I try to help him. I talk to him about it and he kind of shut me down and said, mind my own business. And I kind of minded my own business. I didn't take it to the next place. And I didn't know how to take it to the next place. Honestly, I didn't know the questions to ask. I didn't know who to talk to. And one day uh, I was getting ready to leave. He had the keys to my house and I got home and he had written me a little note and he had committed suicide in my garage. He'd taken a handful of Xanax and asphyxiated himself in my garage. And I fell apart. It took me a couple of years to kind of put it back together uh, by fate or kismet or what have you. I ended up uh, taking a job in marketing for a treatment center. It just so happened. And uh, I just fell into it and I guess jumped in with both feet. And I parlayed that into a position that I could really help people. I still help with the marketing. Obviously, I'm doing this podcast, but I'm the operations director. So I actually get to meet these kids when they come in and I say kids, but it's all ages, but mostly kids, right? 80%. I get to meet them. They, they get off the plane and I greet them at the run at the, you know, the airport. I bring them into the treatment center and uh, I basically became, become their dad for 30 or 45 days when they're here. And uh, I hold their hand, I talk them through it, and I work with a lot of families and parents that don't know what they're doing. And basically, I'm kind of teaching them what I wished I'd known earlier. And that's kind of my goal, and that's what helps me sleep at night. What is it, like, I'm, I'm curious, because I've, I've seen addiction through my life through many family members and stuff like that. And what they've gone through and the treatments they have, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And um, what are the sound? What is addiction? What is addiction to opiates, alcohol, and drugs? What What are the? Yeah. I know they seem different, but what are they? I mean, there are there are addictions to everything. Anything you do obsessively that is affects your life in a negative way it can be a, a, a addiction. I mean, we know smoking it's illegal. Mm -hmm. People smoke, but you know it's not good for you. We know that. And eventually if you smoke long enough, you're going to have a heart attack or cancer or something. Um, same with um, sex. There's sex addictions. There's all kinds of addictions. Uh, the one thing that I guess uh, what we work with are just substance abuse. And uh, we pretty much zero in on uh, drugs and alcohol. And that's a bad one. It kills a lot of people every year. It's one of the leading causes of death. And uh, it's bad. You said it was a pandemic and it is kind of the forgotten pandemic. And during the COVID pandemic, we've seen it grow even exponentially. Um, women in their midlife uh, are drinking way more than they ever did. Um, kids are, you know, this is depressing for everyone. And people turn to drugs and alcohol to help them feel better. So what, was what was interesting too, the, the, I mean, the big talk before the pandemic was the opioid crisis, the opioid mm -hmm. epidemic. And it's funny, but, um, when I was, I'm like, it all just all of a sudden disappeared. And, um, 
the pandemic came the number one thing, which it's not a bad yeah. thing, I guess. And, um, but one thing I was, I was looking up the uh, human health and human services.com, the, um, opiate epidemic by the numbers. And I didn't realize some of the stuff too. Like there's 760, no, 70,630 people died from drug overdoses in 2019. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty awesome. Awful. This it's staggering really. And, uh, What's really horrible is now there is something that I'm sure everyone's heard of by now, but called fentanyl and it comes in across the borders or however it gets here and it's inexpensive and it's deadly. Uh, there is no really check to the strength or anything back in the old days. If you took a hydrocodone or a Xanax or something, you kind of knew the strength and, and you weren't, weren't probably going to die. But now people take, uh, will take heroin or fentanyl, you have no idea what's in it and the strength. And, you know, some of these people will be using it the same amount for, for years and then they get a bad batch or strong batch and, you know, they're dead. Well, how do some people get involved in this stuff too? I mean, is it stress? Is it home life? Is it um, hereditary or is it, what, how do they get involved uh, in something like this? Okay. I'm just going to say yes. <laughs> there, uh, <laughs> Usually uh, there is some kind of trauma that goes along with uh, drugs and alcohol. Not every person, but a huge majority, there is some kind of trauma, whether it's some kind of abuse or sexual abuse or, you know, PTSD. We get a lot of, um, we get a lot of uh, military who suffer from PTSD. They end up uh, doing drugs. Uh, we get a lot of LGBTQ uh, kids that, you know, try to cope and they end up uh, doing this. I don't think anyone starts, well, I know nobody starts doing drugs because they want to die. They do it because it makes their head feel a little bit better. It makes, calms their mind. Um, there's a lot of people with um, schizophrenia and, uh, you know, personality disorders and things like that, bipolar, and they don't get on the correct meds. And for them, you know, it's easier to, just find an illegal substance and they try it and it makes their head feel better. That quiets their mind. And the next thing you know, they're addicted and they can't stop. What I really wanted to talk about is um, dual diagnosis. So most of our patients come in and they will be diagnosed with uh, uh, co-occurring disorders like a mental health issue and addiction. So we try to help with both. We try to get them clean through the detox period. Um, once the drugs are out of their system, then we can assess um, mentally what's going on. We have psychologists and doctors that work in tandem to try to figure out what uh, is the best, you know, case scenario. How do we, how do we bring this person back to center without the illegal medications? And sometimes it takes other types of medications, uh, antidepressants or or things like that, and we figure out what is best for them. We get there, uh, they, we get them centered, and then they stay for about 30 days in a in our residential program once they're detoxed. And by then, we, we kind of have them back on their feet again. And then after that, I suggest that they go into some type of sober living or some kind of uh, an, another level of care that would be lower than ours, where they're able to maybe just go two or three days a week to, um, groups and meetings and things like that. But obviously the longer someone can stay sober, the better their odds of um, long-term sobriety. One thing that was interesting too, is you said those two different diagnoses, mental, mental health uh, diagnosis and drug addiction um, diagnosis. Is it sometimes, is it one of them is like, say in a certain situation, one is not diagnosed like the mental health issues that up and um, they're just trying to work with the, the drug addiction or they always go with both together? Well, um, a good treatment center will uh, try to address both issues and be assessed by a really good doctor and a really good psychologist and, and try to find out uh, kind of off the bat as soon as we can what the issues are. Um, someone who's been high, um, say on crystal meth for a really long time, that really messes you up. And sometimes it takes a couple of weeks of being clean from crystal meth to kind of figure out like, oh, okay, that's not schizophrenia. That's, that was the crystal meth talking 
or sometimes, you know, a couple weeks off of the whatever drug and we say, okay, we see that there is a co-occurring mental health disorder and we um, figure out what that would be and then we treat it. And that way that person doesn't feel like they have to go to illegal drugs to feel better or, you know, have their head feel better. And sometimes these, you know, people are, are undiagnosed for mental health. There's a big stigma about that. There's a stigma about drug addiction. You know, I have people say, oh, I'd be so embarrassed to know that my child is in treatment. It's, I say like, if your child had cancer, would you be embarrassed if they were going to chemotherapy, if they were going to the hospital, you know, for a few weeks to get healthy? You wouldn't feel that way. And we have to start thinking of addiction as just another disease. And it's, it's a horrible disease, but there's nothing to be ashamed about it, you know. Is it, is it genetic, though? Can it be genetic or just um, from your environment? There, there are um, studies that show that there is genetic could be involved, especially with alcohol. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I've met people whose families are alcoholics and, and they get sober and they stay sober. You know, it's not a life sentence for sure. Well, it's interesting, too. Some people think that, um, like some people, like I know some people have anxiety and depression. And because the mom had anxiety and depression, they kind of they kind of yeah. inherited that, and then they take medication for it. Well, it's interesting too. One of the warning signs of a, of an addicted person. I guess we're kind of talking to parents here, especially dads. Um, so I work with parents um, quite often, and they they say, "Well, we never knew," or you know, hopefully it's caught in time before uh, someone passes of of addiction, but they say, you know, we never knew, but there are signs to look for, um, you know, weight loss, um, kids that are uh, anti becoming antisocial who weren't before, um, hanging out with a new group of friends that you don't know, all of a sudden they've changed their whole group of friends that they were hanging out with. Um, what else? Um, money goes missing, you know, oh, you know, there was $20 in my wallet, now it's gone not a big deal, right? 20 bucks, but it could be because 20 bucks is enough to buy enough fentanyl to kill someone. So little signs like that. Um, sometimes uh, parents don't see their kids until the holidays if they're away at college or, or whatever, and they come back and you notice a big change, you know, unkempt, um, thin, uh, not able to hold a conversation, not able to look you in the eye. Those are the signs that you need to be really upfront with your child and, and tell them that you think there's a problem. Well, I was wondering too, I think um, parents sometimes are, they, they're not say blind to it, but don't, don't I don't see my son's no problem. And, and your son seriously needs help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, sometimes we never find out if we don't look, but there's usually a sign and then the next step is once you've realized that your child is um, hooked on something, doing some kind of illegal drugs, um, there is a real tendency to kind of, you know, the, the child is wanting to kind of split the parents if, if it's a two parent family, you know, or mom, dad's being mean to me kind of thing. And they, they know there's always one parent that's a little more lenient or a little more, um, you know, of what's the word I'm looking for, able to, you know, provide money under the table or whatever, you know. So I always say, like, you need a united front, first of all. You need to talk amongst yourselves and make uh, sure that you guys are on the same page. And then you need to um, quit indulging. That's the really hard part. Um, if you provide a car for your child, you know, you got to take those keys and you got to say, you're going to kill somebody until you get help. You're not driving our car. And if you're driving your own car and we know you're inebriated, we'll call 911. Um, you'll kill someone or yourself. So you going to jail would be a lot better than that happening. Um, you know, no more giving money out. If you know that's the case, um, you're, you're not going to come to this house inebriated. Those kinds of things will... Um, oftentimes help the child to see that, you know, they've got to make a change or their life is not going to be easy. And, what, uh, 
But also, like, sometimes the, the uh, parents are the enabler. Yeah, that's true. That, like I said, um, you know, let's let him keep driving his car. Let's let her, um, you know, whatever, get, you know, smoke marijuana in the house. That's not a big deal, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a big deal if she's using other substances and whatever. I mean, it's, you, you have to set some boundaries. And um, when you set those boundaries, you help your loved one hit a rock bottom. So taking a car away, um, not providing money for, you know, stuff, fun stuff, not giving them a roof to live under. Those kinds of things help someone get to rock bottom and that rock bottom will help them get into treatment. And, you know, they realize, well, maybe I can, and I've had this happen. I use this scenario because it, it happens often, you know, okay, well, I'll get my truck back if I go through 30 days of treatment. And that's all I need is uh, the ability to get them in our door and get them, uh, you know, hooked up with some counseling and some really good therapy. And uh, we can hopefully get them over the hump, get them their feet under them and get them, you know, on the right path. Well, what next? What, what once the, the parents decide with the child or um, and they're getting any help, what will they do next? What will be the process? Well, um, you need to find out, first of all, uh, it comes down to probably health insurance. If you don't have a way to means to pay cash for treatment and treatment can be, can be expensive. So um, if you say you had um, an insurance policy, you would find out from your insurance policy if they cover addiction treatment. Most of them do. Some of them don't. They carve it out so that, you know, they, they don't offer it, which is um, really sad because, you know, it's, it's something that's needed. But find out what kind of insurance you have and then do some research. Reach out to a treatment center that uh, you hear good things about. Um, my treatment centers, I have three in uh, Southern California. We take um, patients from all over the country and sometimes even internationally. Um, they'll give me a call and, and let me know what the issue is. I will make sure that uh, we can verify benefits and then we usually will fly them out here um, within the day or day or day and a half to make sure that, you know, nobody goes back on their word and they're, you know, when they're ready for treatment, they, they come right in. And then we start the hard work. It's not easy to go through treatment, but we keep in contact with families and we often even do family sessions via Zoom where the parents and the kids can actually um, try to repair a relationship or at least get that ball rolling in the right direction before they leave to come home. You know, because sometimes there's some pretty tough things that happen when, you know, kids are living at home or parents are trying to get them into treatment. Lots of things are said that aren't meant. Well, what are some maybe some of the success stories, success stories coming through your treatment center? Something you can share that really really touched you. I um, well, every person that comes through here touches me. I literally, uh, literally feel like these are all my kids actually when they come in here because I see like the potential that they have and and how much uh, how much good that. Uh, being sober can do for them. And, and some of these kids feel so lost. And by the time they leave here, their, their little personalities have come out and they are feeling good about themselves and they're feeling, you know, not so bad about the uh, things that have happened in the past because that's in the past. And we talk about futures, but um, I had a guy come in here, he was 40 and he had been to 70 different treatment centers. His parents oh, wow. had indulged him. They've bailed his car out of the impound yard more times that they could count, probably way more than what the car was worth. Um, every time he needed help, they sent him money and he pretty much did whatever he wanted. And the parents were so sweet. But I said, you guys got to get tough. I said, this guy, your son is never going to get help. He'll come in and he'll clean himself up for a couple of weeks. He'll get some new clothes and he'll eat and he'll feel better and then he'll walk out of here and he will then continue his on his way. And the next time he gets in trouble, he'll come into a treatment center, do the same thing. And you guys are enabling that. So you gotta be tough and it's scary. And 
you know, he, this kid threatened suicide and all kinds of stuff. His parents held firm, probably the first time in his life. And he ended up sticking it out and he is still sober. It's been about five or six months now. And uh, for the first time in maybe 20 years, he's stayed sober for a really long period of time. And that's because his parents got on the same page and they, you know, told him how it was. This is no longer what we're going to do for you. You are on your own if you leave treatment. And uh, he figured it out, you know. But those kinds of stories happen all the time. It's amazing um, how once they see that the parents say put a stop to it, set up some kind of boundaries and follow through and they can really help the, the children. Yeah. Tough love. It's hard. It's hard for parents because the worst thing that you can imagine is losing your child. And, uh, you know, you walk that line when your child is an addicted, you know, but you, I've seen parents literally uh, love their children to death and it's not a cliche. It really happens. But I wanted to, I know we're not, we're pretty close to, getting towards the end, I wanted to just talk about the three treatment centers that we have. Um, two of them are in the Palm Springs area, and mm -hmm. one of them is in uh, Encino Hills. And we um, we have a lot of people that come in from, all, like I said, all over the country. Each treatment center is um, geared a little differently for different personalities. So we have the one in LA is uh, geared for more um, older, 30s to 50s, 60s. Um, business people who need to stay connected. Um, the two in Palm Springs, we bring our younger uh, patients here, um, patients who have um, been addicted and relapsed many times. We have very, very good counselors who um, figure out what the triggers are and how to get past those so that um, they can stay sober. And um, anyway, parents can call me directly. I will speak to you on the phone. I'll talk you through it. I will uh, hopefully I can get you to get them here to work with us. But if not, if you have a type of insurance like a, a government health insurance, there are places for um, that as well. Um, most of the time you have to stay in your own state, but I have an 800 number that I can give you for that if, uh, if that's what you're going through right now in the, your circumstances. But there is help for everyone. Where, what's the name of the website? Name me some of the websites of your establishment. Uh, you can go to www.gravitytreatmentcenters, plural.com, uh, Gravity Treatment Centers. You can go on that website and find me. That's the best thing to do instead of trying to give you three different websites. <laughs> go to that gravitytreatmentcenters.com. There's uh, an 800 number. You can call, you can, you'll either reach me or you'll reach a professional who can help you through the whole process. Um, they can explain it to you first if that's what you need to hear. We can speak to your child or your loved one, your wife, your husband, whoever. We can talk to them about uh, their issues and, and figure out if they want to get help, first of all, and if not, why, and maybe we can help you uh, see that maybe that's definitely where you need to go. But I say this all the time. I'm really persuasive in my life. I can talk pretty much anybody into anything, mm -hmm. but I am no match when it comes to illegal drugs. The fentanyl, alcohol, cocaine, crystal meth, they all have me beat. They're way more persuasive than I am. So all I say is when you're tired of that whole life and you feel like you're at the end of your rope, you've lost your job, your marriage is in trouble, your kid, you know, you're, you're about to be kicked out of your parents' house, reach out and we will definitely, definitely give you some avenues, uh, some avenues to go down so that you weren't like me. You know, I, I learned the hard way and uh, it was very, very uh, difficult. I still deal with it, the trauma of losing that friend. But um, if I can help one more person to um, figure out how to get this right, then that that's good for me. And if I can, if you don't mind, I wouldn't mind giving out my phone number. It's an eight hundred okay. number. It's eight three three. My eyes are getting bad. Eight three three two four four fifty nine hundred. So eight three three two four four fifty nine hundred. That rings directly to my. Uh, call center. 
we have someone 24 hours a day taking your calls. We don't have a huge call center. It's two or three people. So if you call back, you probably get the same person, but you will get the help and the, the information that you need. And if you have uh, don't have means or you have um, government type health insurance, you can call the SAMHSA national hotline and it's at uh, 800-663-4357. Um, that's another really good uh, option. I can't obviously take every person who needs help, but I can certainly refer you out or give you some really good advice. And, and that's what you need to get started. Well, Gregory, thank you much for your work and all the stuff you do to help people. It's an important work and getting the word out to help others. I really do appreciate you spending time today talking about addiction and help getting people help. I really do appreciate it. All the links will be in the show notes for this episode, sir. I really do appreciate your time. Thank you, Joe. Really appreciated your time. And you know, hopefully somebody's heard this that needs me.